Out of the entire English language, no term, no political or economic theory incites passionate responses quite like Marxism. Hope, political struggle, and in the Western world, often feelings of fear and disorder. But of the things that contribute to the antagonistic feelings towards Marxism, often and understandably, they come from pure confusion. Confusion that comes from a world that purposefully keeps Marxism under a clouded veil, and perhaps, more specifically, a political and economic theory that being Marxism is a bit complicated in a number of ways. First, we have a political and economic theory grounded in dialectics, an analytic that is a bit complex and foreign to most people today. And for people who are familiar with dialectics, Marxism incorporates dialectics in a material, physical sense, formerly called dialectical materialism. Further, Marxism incorporates this very material analysis through history, understanding the changing tides of history being primarily driven by the ebb and flow, the change, and more specific to Marxism, the dialectic of history through material conditions and relations, with this being called historical materialism. This still may seem a little confusing, but that's okay. We will hopefully clear up all of this confusion throughout the video. This very confusion likely being one of the reasons Frederick Engels wrote this book. There have been plenty of contemporary scholars and authors who have done a great job at explaining Marxism in a simpler, understandable lens, yet being written in 1880, socialism, utopian, and scientific still remains as one of the clearest and easy to understand articulations of Marxism in its analytical content. For the pretty insane feat that that is, I'm excited to bring this to you. So let's get into it. This is socialism, utopian, and scientific, just in video form. From the start, it is incredibly important to establish what Engels is trying to do and the approach he is taking. This book really serves as an extremely efficient explanation into the core mechanics of Marxism and of socialism, while also elaborating on how socialism isn't necessarily a simple doctrine or prescriptive goal. Rather, it is a scientific and economic reality, one that grows more inevitable out of a large-scale capitalist industry and its very consequences. This analytic and dialectical movement within and of socialism is shown right at the beginning of the book on top of part one, Utopian Socialism. Modern socialism is, in its essence, the direct product of the recognition on the one hand and of the class antagonisms existing in the society of today between proprietors and non-proprietors, between capitalists and wage workers, on the other hand of the anarchy existing in production. But in its theoretical form, modern socialism originally appears ostensibly as a more logical extension of the principles laid down by the great French philosophers of the 18th century. Like every new theory, modern socialism had, at first, to connect itself with the intellectual stock and in trade ready to its hand, however deeply its roots lay in material economic facts. Engels wants to make it explicitly clear, socialism isn't just an explicit political dream or sought-after political system. No, it is something that emerges because of capitalism itself. If there is one thing we should establish at the beginning of this video, it is this. Marxism, in so many ways, is not necessarily a prescriptive politics on its own. It's a dialectical analysis of the world, the political economy, and capitalism as we know it. In many ways, it's a pure analytic. It's an examination, not necessarily an ideology on its own. This is something that in today's world gets glossed over absolutely everywhere. So part one is called Utopian Socialism. Thus, the natural thing to ask, what does this mean? Here we have to lay down the groundwork to how we get to the material nature of a utopian model of socialism, and why, according to Engels, is an already existing material reality that is developing at the time of this book. But the groundwork starts with the French Revolution and some of the philosophers of that time. Here we see that with the French Revolution, and we can include the American Revolution in this too. These now historical revolutions primarily existed within the plane of idealism. What that means is that it was a revolution that resulted and was based in a conceptual plane of ideas, rather than a very concrete material reality. Political liberty, ideas of individual liberty, and rights. Engels points out that these revolutions, the Enlightenment, primed our mind for understanding a sanctity and necessity of good human conditions, where people deserve fundamental rights, 
didn't deserve brutal conditions and demeaning relations under feudal and monarchical societies. Engels brings up thinkers like Rousseau, who spearheaded these ideas in a revolutionary context. We have talked about the link between Rousseau and Marx on this channel, here is a link above. But to Engels, there are fundamental problems with this, as this quote-unquote freedom existed purely in the abstract. There wasn't a material or economic reflection of this. Thus, we see the creation of things like Napoleonic despotism or mass slavery in the United States. Freedom or rights are not truly universal in an idealistic sense. It must take place on a very material front to be a universal reality. And to Angles in the late 1880s, slivers of this material emancipation were already developing and taking place. These were theoretical enunciations corresponding with these revolutionary uprisings of a class not yet developed. In the 16th and 17th centuries, utopian pictures of ideal social conditions in the 18th century, actual communistic theories, the demand for equality was no longer limited to political rights. It was extended also to the social conditions of individuals. It was not simply class privileges that were to be abolished, but class distinctions themselves. A communism aesthetic denouncing all the pleasures of life, Spartan was the first form of the new teaching. Then came the three great utopians, Saint Simon, to whom the middle class movement, side by side with the proletarian, still had a certain significance, Fourier and Owen, who in the contrary were capitalist, production was most developed, and under the influence of the antagonisms begotten of this worked out his proposals for the removal of class distinction systematically and in direct relation to French materialism. Engels points out that Henry de Saint Simon was among the first theorists to notice that the project of liberating the world through this idealism, through pure reason, seen in the French Revolution, was totally insufficient, not only in theory but in reality. Engels writes about Saint Simon's experience after the French Revolution, or even after the revolution, workers and people of the third estate in France, now liberated from the original ruling monarchy, now were in conflict with bankers and other wealthy individuals. After the revolution, it was clear the only true victory was for the ruling class. Thus, this is where Engels claims the French and American revolution can be accurately called bourgeoisie or ruling class revolutions. These revolutions did much in allowing the new progression of individual rights, but more than anything, it allowed the people to see the sheer limits of the liberal enlightenment project thus far. This is where we hit the utopian form of socialism, exactly where we see emancipation past pure abstract individual rights. This new socialism was seen all the way in Indiana, specifically with Robert Owen in the town of New Harmony. In its short time, working conditions were among the best. They worked shorter hours, and education was one of the very few places in the U.S. where it was practically universal for all children. Here we see that Engels makes the point that this socialism, this new system past capitalism, wasn't merely utopian in an abstract ideal. It was utopian in a very material sense, where it was already unfolding and being tried. If anything, this shows the concrete nature of the book's title, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. But here, we have only scratched the surface with the latter part of the title, that being scientific. Here is where we get into just that. This is where dialectics comes in. This analytic and the very engine of Marxism. The very thing Engels claims is the scientific nature of this quote-unquote utopian socialism, and more abstractly, Marxism. It is exactly where Engels shines. Much of the importance of this book is how well he can presciently and easily elaborate on dialectics in a material sense, the core logic of Marxism that is rather complex to a world of people not well acquainted with dialectical thought. But dialectics and materialism is still confusing and fancy language to many, so let's do some heavy lifting here. Engels says the following, In the meantime, along with and after the French philosophy of the 18th century, had arisen the new German philosophy, culminating in Hegel. Its greatest merit was the taking up again of dialectics as the highest form of reasoning. The old Greek philosophers were all born natural dialecticians, and Aristotle, the most encyclopedic of them, had already analyzed the most essential forms of dialectic thought. The newer philosophy, on the other hand, although in its also dialectics, had brilliant exponents, e.g. Descartes and Spinoza, 
had, especially through English influence, become more and rigidly fixed in the so-called metaphysical mode of reasoning, by which also the French of the 18th century were almost wholly dominated, at all events in their special philosophical work. Outside philosophy in the restricted sense, the French nevertheless produced masterpieces of dialectic. While the German philosopher Hegel really brought forward dialectics in a more complex way than the Greeks, the Greeks in many ways had one of the first dialectical ways of viewing the world. They saw the world as something radically interconnected, as a world connected with changes and contradictions. There were no simple things, pure objects, but connected processes. There are differences between the dialectics of the Greeks and Hegel, and we can't do a complete deep dive into this, rather because of time, but I will try to visualize a good surface understanding of dialectical thought. To understand dialectics, we can see it's helpful to see its sort of opposite, individual and singular approach. Engels claims that this correct and fruitful way of viewing the world was completely flipped on its head with John Locke and English philosophy, with what he calls Lockean metaphysics. This Lockean metaphysics is still, in 2021, arguably the leading way in which we view the world, as objects, ideas, subjects that are radically individual and can be compared and contrasted as stagnant entities transfixed and stuck in time. This is a core reason why something like dialectics can be initially hard to grasp. It is so radically different from the way in which we view everything, things that are interconnected, a part of a process that changes within time. Engels points out that Hegel was one of the greatest philosophers in the sense that he saw the sheer limitations of this Lockean, singular, individual way of viewing the world. Yet Engels claims, along with Marx, that there is a massive limitation to the way his dialectics existed. It was something that was purely conceptual, that existed as an abstract idea stuck in the atmosphere, something separate from the material around us and of us. Marx and Engels called for an analysis far more concrete and physical, a dialectical structure but examined within material, thus the term dialectical materialism. In a concrete sense, Engels visualizes this dialectical materialism with the process of nature, and specifically with the example of death. On the surface, we know when something is alive or dead, but when you get close on the cellular level, this question is much harder to answer. When was the exact moment of this death? When did it exactly occur on a cellular level? Scientifically, this is extremely difficult to answer. Death is not a momentary, singular event. It's a process. Thus, dialectics and understanding its movement and process, according to Engels, is the only thing truly worthy of examining this phenomenon. Under a metaphysical approach, well, you are either dead or alive. It's binary. That's really it. This viewpoint doesn't appreciate the link, the process of being alive or just being dead. Engels gives even more examples. The state of simply being alive in a singular sense, a metaphysical sense, is still insufficient. Our cell structure is constantly changing. Engels says this here. In like manner, every organized being is every moment the same and not the same. Every moment, it assimilates matter supplied from without and gets rid of other matter. Every moment, some cells of its body die and others build themselves anew. In a longer or shorter time, the matter of its body is completely renewed and is replaced by other molecules of matter, so that every organized being is always itself, and yet something other than itself. In many ways, with this understanding, we kind of exist in the past, present, and future at once as cells work. Or more presciently, the creation of new cells with the death of other cells is what constitutes the synthesized, alive state that we are in. Thus our being alive is in dialectical tension, the tension of dying cells and simultaneously new created ones. Our cells are dying while our bodies are simultaneously making new ones with even more cells being created as we speak, in a present sense. Engels would ask the question, what then is this then a massive contradiction to how we view the world and ideas as stagnant entities through this English anti-dialectical, anti-processual metaphysics? So, to sum part two up, the Greeks had an incredibly fruitful dialectical view of the world. Later philosophy was then turned on its head by more English philosophers such as Locke where a new metaphysical singular view of the world was further incorporated. 
Then Hegel came around and pointed out that the true science of the world was dialectics and processes. Then from Hegel, Marx and Engels came around and argued that Hegel didn't place enough emphasis on the material realm. It was too conceptual in many ways. Thus, Engels argues that dialectical materialism is a new, very exciting science in which we have just scratched the surface. Engels leaves part two of the book with this. The class struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie came to the front in the history of the most advanced countries in Europe. In proportion to the development upon the one hand of modern industry, upon the other of the newly acquired political supremacy of the bourgeoisie. Facts more and more strenuously gave the lie to the teachings of bourgeoisie economy as to the identity of the interests of capital and labor, as to the universal harmony and universal prosperity that would be the consequence of unbridled competition. Of all these things could no longer be ignored, any more than the French and English socialism, which was their theoretical, though very imperfect, expression. But the old idealist conception of history, which was not yet dislodged, knew nothing of class struggles based upon economic interest, knew nothing of economic interest, production, and all economic relations appeared in it only as incidental, subordinate elements in the history of civilization. Here we hit part three of the book, on historical materialism. Before we dive directly in, let's clear up a massive and extremely common misunderstanding around what historical materialism is. So, all right. So, let's take the same postmodernist approach. So, here's some basic tenets of Marxism. It's bourgeoisie against proletariat. The bourgeoisie are the capitalists, the property owners, those sorts of people. The proletariat, working class, for all intents and purposes. The basic idea is that history itself is nothing but the, what would you call it, the documentation of the struggle of one class against the other. This clip is so laughably wrong it hurts. Historical materialism or a Marxist narrative of history isn't that the complete totality of history is class conflict and that's all there is, but that through an analysis of the world through material formations, we see constant dialectical tension on the grounds of material and one's environment. We see that with animals, beings all develop from the environment and material around them. Then from the time of human civilization, we find a similar phenomenon, just within societal context. As far as human social history goes, class conflict is a complete universal, but it's not the totality of history. That's not all that exists within history. Absolutely nowhere do Marx and Engels ever claim that the totality of history is just class conflict. That's complete bullshit. Again, thinking dialectically, we come to see constant tension between lower, working classes, and upper classes. This tension is always present in some facet in history, but it absolutely does not say that it is all of history in its totality. Anyways, back to the video at hand. Engels starts out part three with the idea that since society's inception, Historical materialism consists of an understanding that forces of production are the main universal baseline of how our social foundations are ultimately structured. Of course, other things play a role in our structuring of society, but through a material lens, this is the ultimate baseline. It's ground zero. The Engels points out this has been the case even in feudal society. Understanding the dialectical course of history, we see that seeds of capitalism were firmly planted in feudalism. With these very new ruling class revolutions, French and American, ironically paving the way for capitalism to thrive. This is the important thing to note. Marx and Engels do not typically have a moralistic tonality to their analysis of capitalism. They don't claim capitalism to be some monumentally evil entity on its own. Rather, it works in contradictions, and their goal is to point these contradictions out. We are free from lords in a feudal system, Yet in capitalism, our new lords are the bourgeoisie and the owners of production. Capitalism has emancipated and freed us on the realm of gender and traditional tyrannical social ties, but now women are forced to sell their labor power to a capitalist or they will starve. Dialectics show these contradictions are baked into the very fiber of capitalism. So much so that the most purely capitalist approach to economics only harms itself in the end where smaller capitalists become swallowed by larger capitalists for an economic system that promises decentralized freedom only to become more centralized in the end, where wealth, power, and political leverage becomes far more centralized in the hands of a few. 
where corporations and industry merge together as trust to survive. In the trust, freedom of competition changes into its very opposite, into monopoly, and the production without any definite plan of capitalistic society capitulates to the production upon a definite plan of the invading socialistic society. Certainly, this is so far still to the benefit and advantage of the capitalist, but in this case, the exploitation is so palpable that it must break down. No nation will put up with production conducted by trust with so barefaced an exploitation of the community by a small band of dividend mongers. Engels uses historical materialism as to show how we came from feudalism to capitalism and how we are seeing the massive self-inflicted contradictions within capitalism today very contradictions that show its inability to stand on its own two feet. From here, the larger analysis shows a system past capitalism is merely inevitable, an inevitability that shows its face every 10 years. Engels points out that ruling classes and the bourgeoisie bankrupt economies every 10 years with workers who take the brunt, who become economically devastated while capitalists simply socialize their own losses. To Engels, modernity and capitalism has helped us understand the fruitful, productive nature of democratizing forms of government and to eliminate harsh centralization of power, to democratically expand fundamental rights. But in capitalist economics, what we see is pure economic aristocracy, a pure authoritarian group or individual with an almost limitless set of powers, a power only thanks to workers, yet utilized by a small capitalist aristocracy that kills itself via economic crisis every 10 years or so. To Engels, if we are to recognize the new values of modern democracy, of anti-authoritarianism, we must also face it head on against a bourgeoisie that would see its communities burn rather than give a penny away in profit. For Engels, this calls for a revolution where a proletariat and working class work to establish a democratic means of production. Yet, this can only happen within certain historical stages in development, a very stage in development where Engels says, at the time of this writing, is right now. Engels leaves us with this. To accomplish this act of universal emancipation is the historical mission of the modern proletariat. To thoroughly comprehend the historical conditions and thus the very nature of this act to impart to the now oppressed proletarian class a full knowledge of the conditions and of the meaning of the momentous act it is called upon to accomplish. This is the task of the theoretical expression of the proletarian movement, scientific socialism. Thank you all so much for watching and making it to the end. As always, I have a giant request at the end of these. These videos take an immense amount of work and time to make, and without help from Patreon and our YouTube members, it would be completely impossible to keep this channel alive. It's just far too much work and takes far too much time. It's an ask that I don't take lightly though, but if you could spare a couple dollars a month, you would ensure this channel survives for the near future. A future that is a little shaky because of the relatively small size of this channel and the pretty expensive upkeep of it. To anyone who can support, I offer exclusive videos, early access, the ability to vote on future videos, and most of all, my utmost thanks. Something else that is immensely helpful is bookmarking our Amazon affiliate link and using it when making purchases. It gives me a small percentage of whatever you purchase, and it helps a ton. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for anything that you can do, and most of all, thank you to the very people who have supported me so far. I promise to try my absolute hardest not to let any of you down. But before we go on the topic of support, I want to give a huge shout out to a special patron, Jose David Guevara. Thank you for the large pledge and your massive support. It truly keeps all of this alive. Thanks again, everyone, for watching, and I'll see you all next time.